Hey everybody, this is AP Macro. We're doing a review of major graphs. And in this video, we're talking about the consumption function. Now, I'm going to be honest, guys. I've never seen the AP Macro test ask the student to draw that graph. However, however, I have seen all kinds of AP Macro questions in which if a student understood this graph, it would help them very much in answering those questions. Guys, graphs are tools. They help us process information and get results, okay? You're going to see as I go through this that there's all kinds of ways that this graph can help us answer questions. I hope that makes sense to you. Now, again, it's called consumption function. When is it introduced? It's normally introduced as students are starting to study aggregate demand, okay? So you get oftentimes to perhaps the third unit in a class, and now you're going to start studying the ASAD model. And the first thing you're going to study is this thing called aggregate demand, which is our total spending curve. Well, when I say total spending, what makes up total spending? Consumption, investment, government purchase, and net exports. But right here at the beginning is consumption. You see, consumption is 70% or somewhere around 70% of total spending in most economies. Now, certainly it might be a little bit below or a little bit above, but it is the major component of spending in most economies out there. So, most textbooks, most plant classes, as they start to study AD, the first thing they're going to study is the consumption function because how important it is to AD. All right, here we go. I've got a graph. It's going to be my consumption function. Here's how it works, guys. In economics, we want to study something. We want to study consumption because it's so important. So, we make a consumption function. And we say, okay, what's the number one thing that determines our level of consumption? And what is it, guys? Disposable income. And so we take that number one thing that determines our level of consumption and we put it on the graph as the independent variable. So right here on the horizontal axis, just like in normal math class, guys, we're going to put current disposable income. Current disposable income. Why are we putting current disposable income on the graph? Just like I said, guys, it's the number one thing that determines our level of consumption. Dependent variable goes right here. That's consumption, household spending, right? So what we're saying is consumption, household spending, is dependent on current disposable income. What is the relationship between the two? Very much a positive relationship. Current disposable income increases, consumption is going to increase. Current disposable income decreases, consumption is going to decrease. The next thing that we see in this graph is this vertical intercept is positive, guys. We're not starting at the origin of zero, which means that there is some level of consumption that we will do regardless of current disposable income. Another way to say it is even if current disposable income was zero, we would still spend money, okay? So we call that autonomous consumption. Autonomous meaning independent, right? This is our level of consumption that is independent of current disposable income, i.e. autonomous of current disposable income, not dependent upon current disposable income. So that's what that intercept is. I also want to label the line, right? The line, of course, is consumption spending. So we put consumption. Next, we want to talk about the slope, right? Slope is always important. So what is the slope of this curve? Well, remember, that is rise run, right? Rise over run. So when our independent variable changes by some amount, okay, what is that? Our delta di, we're going to get our consumption to change by a certain amount. Delta consumption, right? Hopefully that makes sense. When current disposable changes by some amount, current consumption is going to go up by a certain amount. So we're looking at delta di, delta c. Guys, that slope is known something known as something macroeconomics. It's known as the MPC, marginal propensity to consume. It is so important that students know that the marginal propensity to consume is the delta in consumption, right? That's the rise, that's what goes in uh, the numerator, over the delta in DI, okay? That's an incredibly important formula, and that is the slope of the consumption function. Now, next, we also need to know there's something else you can do with your disposable income, right? You can save. So, there is this thing called the MPS. The MPS is our delta in savings over our delta in DI. So, my hope is that when you study the consumption function, you link these two things that we very much need to know. Also, of course, it's important that a student knows the MPC plus the MPS 
equals one, okay? Those two added together equals one because there's only two things that we do with our disposable income. Next, let's talk about what changes consumption. Well, we've already talked about if current disposable income changes, consumption changes. But what can change current disposable income? Well, that would be taxes, right? Especially something like personal income taxes. But technically speaking, even payroll taxes, corporate profit taxes, all of those are going to change current disposable income because we have a circular flow. So taxes change current disposable income. So this says, hey, anytime we change taxes, current disposable uh, consumption is going to change. What else changes current disposable income is transfer payments, right? Transfer payments. So what do we associate those two things with? Fiscal policy. Fiscal policy, two of their three levers are focused on changing consumption. Remember, there's three lever levers of fiscal policy. One is government purchases. That doesn't have anything to do with this graph. But the other two is taxes and transfer payments. And the way that they get changes in spending when they change taxes and transfer payments is the fact that they're changing current disposable income when they change these, which therefore definitely changes consumption. That is super important that we always keep that in mind. Also that we link these two changes to changes in AD. Now finally, what else changes consumption? Well, there's some exogenous variables that will cause this curve to shift. And this curve, by the way, shifts up and down, okay? This is not a supply-demand graph. Consumption function is built just the way mathematicians build functions, dependent here, independent here. This curve actually shifts up and down. What are those exogenous factors that can change consumption? Now, there's a lot, but normally, we usually hear about two big ones. Number one is aggregate wealth, okay? So wealth, the wealth of our households. Now, when we talk about our household wealth, what should we think about? I think the biggest two things is their home value and the value of their stocks, okay? So we want to tie wealth to home prices and stock market and stock prices, right? So the idea is this, if all of a sudden there's a housing bubble that burst, right? And we've heard of that before, it happened with the Great Recession. So all of a sudden there's this big drop in housing values. What's happening to the wealth of the average American out there? Well, it's going down. They're saying, oh my gosh, my house is worth so much less now. Now I have to readjust the way I think about how wealthy I am. I'm much less wealthy than I thought. And guess what? My consumption is going to shift down because I'm going to now consume less at every level of disposable income because i got to build my wealth back up. Same with the stock market. When the stock market crashes, okay, it comes way down. Americans say, hey, I feel less wealthy. I'm now going to spend less at every level of current disposable income. So definitely wealth effects are big on consumption and therefore aggregate demand. The other one is consumer confidence. It's sometimes stated as consumer's expectation of future disposable income, okay? Consumer confidence. But think, what, what is their expectations about future disposable income based upon? It's a based upon their consumer confidence about the economy. So consumer confidence also is going to shift that curve. If people start feeling better about the economy, i.e. expect their future disposable income to go up, what will they do? They will begin to spend a little bit more at all levels of their disposable income. That's just how we are. We get more optimistic. We're like, hey, you know what? I might borrow a little bit more and spend a little bit more. I might just save a little bit less. Hey, you know that debt we wanted to add on the house? Let's add that deck on the house, something like that. Um, and of course, if consumer confidence comes down, if people become pessimistic about the economy, pessimistic about them, their ability to keep their job, the consumption function is going to come down, meaning they're going to consume less at every level of current disposable income. So again, this is the consumption function. You're probably never going to have to actually graph it, but there's going to be all kinds of questions related to it, okay? One of the big things is what changes consumption? What did we went to go through? Current disposable income? Absolutely. Taxes? Absolutely. Transfer payments? Wealth? Okay, wealth effects. Things like home prices and stock prices. And then finally, consumer confidence. And guys, any of those things that change consumption change AD. And we know if AD changes, real GDP and the price level change. And finally, again, 
What's the slope of that curve? The slope of that curve is our change in consumption over our change in disposable income, known as the marginal propensity to consume, which reminds us of our marginal propensity to save, delta saving over delta di, and we know we add those together and we get one. And then just one little final thing to leave you on. Hey, that spending multiplier, what is that spending multiplier? It is one over one minus the MPC, which is one over the NPS. And you definitely need to know what that spending multiplier is. Put it on the board really quickly. Spending multiplier, one over NPS. There you go, guys. The consumption function is a tool to answer macroeconomic questions. Hope that makes sense to you. We'll see you in another video.